please welcome to the stage Ari Ravenhoft. Thank you so much. So this will be broadcast on Sirius XM 6 a.m. on Monday morning and probably again at some point during the holidays when we're running best of. So let me just get started. And we're doing this like a radio show, so it'll have the sound of a radio show, not necessarily of a stage speech. You're listening to Sirius XM Progress 127, The Agenda, live from Roots Camp, and we are very pleased to welcome with us today the congressman from Florida, Representative Alan Grayson, who many of you know. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> congressman Grayson, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you and also on the radio. Many people have told me I have a face for radio. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to have you here is because I, I view you as more than a congressman. You're an organizer in Congress, uh, and this is a conference for progressive organizers to get together. And the evidence that of that is uh, there was a Dave Weigel piece earlier in the year, not to brag on you on stage, but it called you the most effective member of Congress based on the amount of amendments you've passed. Now, you're a second-term non-consecutive representative in a minority in the House, yet you're passing more amendments than any other member of Congress. That shows an ability to organize. What do you credit that success with? Well, we attack every bill, whether it's a bill on the floor or a bill in one of my committees, the Science Committee or the Foreign Affairs Committee. As soon as it pops up, we go after it. And this is true of bills on other committees as well. So I feel that my job is to take whatever the Republicans may toss at us and try to make it less bad, sometimes even better. And there are opportunities to do that. I don't think that I need to somehow meet them halfway. On the contrary, I think that I can implement progressive principles by finding things either that they regard as good for them for whatever reason or things that they're afraid to vote against. And part of the other reason I wanted to have you here was the issue of Syria. You came uh -huh. out very early in opposition to Syria. You worked and you organized opposition to Syria. And this was a, a big victory for progressives because we went from a dynamic where war in Syria was a definite thing. The media had reported it, the political establishment was all lined up behind it, and you stood up very early and said no and then organized opposition. So let's start with why did you say no so quickly? Well, let's start with something that is in some respects even more important, okay. which is the fact that it all started on your show. Well, that, that is more important. <laughs> <laughs> that people listening to your show heard the first inklings of organized opposition uh, to going to war in Syria. And the fact is that it's a classic example of what I was just referring to. The Democrats saw the issue one way, the Republicans saw the issue the other way. It didn't matter. We both agreed that war ag against Syria w was dangerous, it was imprudent, uh, it wouldn't do any good, and it would cost a lot of money. And from the Democrats' perspective, I think the most important argument was the argument that it just wasn't going to do any good. We were not going to be able to remove the weapons of mass destruction from Syria. On the contrary, we'd run the risk that we'd put them in uh, the hands of uh, people who might do worse with them. Um, secondly, with regard to the Republicans, the Republicans generally looked at the war plans and said, these plans just don't make any sense to us. We're not these plans aren't going to be effective. They're not going to accomplish anything. This is not a proper use of the U.S. military. Uh, these little pinprick uh, 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 attacks are not actually going to do anything, but they are going to, in the eyes of the world, weaken us. So the Democrats saw it one way. They were willing to give the president the, the, uh, uh, the benefit of the doubt, but nevertheless were concerned about the, what they were seeing, which is that it would be ineffective. The Republicans said, this is not what the U.S. military is for. Either way, we ended up on the same side. And we had to organize, organize, organize the way that you were referring to earlier, uh, whether it was through the media, uh, whether it was online with our petition campaign, or, or whether it was just me talking to members of Congress individually and providing them with information from the media or from uh, people who were in touch with the issue. We had to organize in every conceivable thorough sense. I think the media was, in many respects, the most important. We saw the polls move 16 points in one week as a result of what people were seeing on their TV screens, not just what the administration was trying to get out, which is basically to monopolize the conversation, but our arguments that were, that were getting to people and they were sinking in. I remember doing seven national TV interviews in one day. We did 40 interviews in three days when you combine all the different media, and it had an impact. 
because we were moving Congress, we were moving the House, uh, we were moving public opinion, uh, and we were organizing uh, people who were vehemently against it. I think people who were for the attack were always no more than lukewarm. Uh, people who were against it were really, really against it. And the polls didn't show that, that, that flowering uh, of, of vehement opposition. It wasn't so much that people uh, w were tired of war. Uh, people were fed up with war. They were upset with war. And we were able to galvanize that public opinion. You said organize, organize, organize. One of the most interesting organizing venues people don't talk about that's really interesting to me is the floor of the House during votes, because it's your opportunity to talk to members to not necessarily even on Syria, but uh, get co-sponsors for bills, uh, target certain members who you might not be able to talk to otherwise. Could you describe that process? Well, yes. First of all, there's a firm rule with no exceptions that you can only vote physically present. In fact, this came up earlier this year because um, two of the Republicans who were supposed to be sworn in on January 3rd when we were rest of us were sworn in were actually at a fundraiser. And they, they raised their hand watching the TV screen and pretended to be sworn in. So as a result of that, we had to redo all the votes all over again uh, from the first few days because they hadn't been properly sworn in and they shouldn't have been voting until they were probably sworn in. Then they were ultimately sworn in properly. So well, they were sworn in on the lobbyist Bible. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's exactly right. So there's, there's this ironclad rule, no exceptions, you have to be there to vote. And there have been talks over the years, well, it's the 21st century, and maybe people can vote over the internet, maybe they can call in their vote by telephone. If somebody misses an airplane, should we really penalize them for, in, 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 for that by missing their vote? And the answer always has been, the system is there for a reason, and the reason is we are a collegial body. Uh, we are there uh, not only to vote, but also to listen to each other, to talk to each other, uh, to try to uh, basically do business of one kind or another on the floor, to persuade each other, to en entice each other, uh, to, to try to create a certain solidarity. Now, of course, the, the House, like America as a whole, is hopelessly divided in many respects. But even in that kind of environment, it serves a very concrete purpose. Democrats still talk to Democrats. Republicans still talk to Republicans. Some Democrats, like me, still talk to the Republicans. And one of the secrets of our success in getting more amendments passed this year than any other member of Congress, Democratic or Republican, is the fact that I do talk to them. And I, I do try to, in some respects, make the argument to them. And people mistake this for, well, you go out to dinner with them and they like you, and the, that's how good things happen. That is completely false. The way that good things happen, the way you manage to reach across the aisle, is that you demonstrate to them that what you're proposing is in everyone's best interest, including theirs. Well, that's interesting because you often hear, well, Washington would be better if we all had breakfast together more or had lunch together more or had the same cat sitter. Then Washington would be awesome, but it's, it's actually about working together and finding ways to get things done. I would invite some of those people who feel that way to actually have breakfast with members of Congress. They'll be bored. Um, They'll be thoroughly unimpressed, I can guarantee you that. Uh, most members of Congress uh, have no special superpowers. Um, it just doesn't work that way. Um, I don't have any resistance from members of Congress who are Republicans, uh, no matter what my reputation might be, in sitting down with them and telling them, I've got an amendment coming up, this is why it's good for you and your district. And that's it. That's the only thing that really matters in the end. Uh, they uh, don't really want to schmooze a lot of us are too busy to schmooze. Uh, we have a limited amount of time in which we have to accomplish a lot of different things. So wh what you do is you, you tell people the truth. You don't waste their time. That's the most effective way to make your point. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner is for the lobbyists, not for the members. So on Syria, how much reaching across the aisle did you do during those first few days where you were building opposition to, to the war? A tremendous amount. I mean, first what we did is we organized our own whipping operation. That's what you do in order to line up Democrats, if you're a Democrat, Republicans, if you're a Republican. So we lined up our Democrats as best as we could, basically going one-on-one -on -one against the president because the president was trying to line up Democrats at the same time as we were. But then we noticed that there was no whipping operation on the other side which caused us some concern because we thought, well, if we want to win, we have to win with both the Democrats and the Republicans. So what we did is we set up indirectly a parallel whipping operation. We identified peop key people on the other side of the aisle who were definitely going to be against military intervention in Syria by the United States, and we kept feeding them things and encouraging them to send them around. Here, walk this around on the floor of the House. Here, send this around in a dear colleague letter. So we were giving them information that they could then 
uh, used to, uh, to persuade their own colleagues. And I went across the floor and spoke to a number of people on the other side when we had the time to do that. But what, what really worked most effectively was seeing it through our eyes and at the same time seeing it through their eyes and realizing what we were thinking about, realizing what they were thinking about, and then marshalling the arguments in favor of, the, of, of both sides uh, being against the war. So you were whipping behind the scenes in Congress. On the, uh, on the Internet, there was a whip count at Fire Dog Lake. There was a whip count at Think Progress. How much did that come into play with the private whipping you were doing in the House? Oh, very much so, because the administration's operation consisted in entirely of what you and I discussed uh, on, on the radio at the time, which is they wanted to, as they put it, flood the zone. Uh, they wanted to uh, dominate the conversation. They wanted only information in favor of military intervention to be in front of people's eyes, and in particular in front of the eyes of members of Congress, because they, they decided to uh, give us the vote on this. Um, and, and that, so it was super important to be able to break through that. Uh, whether it was through members of Congress or whether it was with the, the public at large. But um, in addition to that, the, the counts that you're referring to basically gave lie to the administration's arguments that they were winning. Uh, above all, they wanted to create a sense of momentum. As soon as uh, Pelosi and Hoyer and Boehner and Cantor, the four leaders of, of the parties in, in the House, came out in favor of military intervention, they said, it's all over. They'll, they'll bring huge numbers of folks along with them. And we knew it wasn't true because I had been speaking to people on both sides of the aisle. I had been listening carefully to what people were saying and what people were thinking on both sides of the aisle. I knew it wasn't true, but we had to show that it wasn't true. And so the whip counts that you're describing at Fire Dog Lake, at Huffington Post, at the Washington Post, those demonstrated objectively that we, that we were winning, that the administration was not creating any sort of movement in its own direction. And this was painfully obvious when the president went on TV, which was supposed to be the final straw. This is what was going to actually win the public over. The president went on TV, and what we found and demonstrated through whip counts is that uh, seven members who had been undecided declared against military intervention as soon as they heard the president, and one actually switched from being in favor of it to being against it. And the whip counts demonstrated that. And at that point, it was all over. The conversation was closed. How do you set up that whip count in your office? What are, what are the mechanisms you use there? Well, actually, we relied upon the Fire Dog Lake whip count because it was the most detailed and actually cited sources. Uh, I often spoke on TV of the Washington Post whip count because that's a brand name that people understand. And I could tell people that based upon the Washington Post whip count, the Democrats were 3 to 1 or 4 to 1 against military intervention. The Republicans were 10 to 1 against it. And people would readily understand that. But the Fire Dog Lake effort was extremely good, very valuable to us. And it allowed us to actually go back to the original sources. You know, it's, it's not that easy to track down uh, what someone said at the Des Moines Register. But the, the Fire Dog Lake uh, whip count gave us a list, citations, and links. Uh, so that I could go to individual members and say, hey, I heard what you said uh, to the, the Des Moines Register about this. Thanks for your support. So what lessons did you learn for future fights here with Syria? Well, one of the lessons uh, that, that I learned was that it's very important to understand how different members come to the issue differently. We had some members, a small number, but they were there, who thought of this issue in terms of international law. Would a, a U.S. attack on Syria be a violation of international law. If that's what matters to them, then that's what matters to them, and you have to give them the arguments in favor or oppose, as the case may be, on the, the matter that, it, that matters to them. A another group was interested in, would it be better to spend this money some other way, like through humanitarian aid? Again, that particular audience needed to be addressed in that particular way. Another group said, is this going to mean that we're going to have a supplemental Defense Department request for appropriation? And that means that we're going to bust the budget. And actually, there were more Republicans concerned about that than Democrats. Again, you have to think hard about what it is that's on people's minds individually and appeal to them. And then you have the general themes, the Democrats being uh, concerned that the, the attack would be ineffective, the Republicans being concerned that it was not a proper use of the US military. Now, one thing that's interesting to me is your tactics seem to be subsuming the tactics that leadership would use a decade ago and taking them on in an individual member's office. How much uh, have you thought about the fact that leadership power is diminished by that? Well, it's not diminished by anything that we do, but it certainly is diminished. Uh, you can see the chaos uh, that, that we've seen now for years with Boehner nominally in charge 
Uh, he's probably the weakest speaker of the House in generations. Uh, we've never had somebody who had to rely upon the, uh, the minority parties to get, to get the votes that he needs time after time after time. We're now up to a, a 10. 10 times he's had to put a bill on the floor without having votes in his own party to pass it and relying upon Democratic votes to put it through. And of course, one abortion uh, on the farm bill where he thought he had the Democratic votes and he didn't, and that ended up a major bill going down to defeat right in front of our eyes. So w w the leadership is, is impotent in many respects. Uh, and there's a number of different reasons for that. One reason for that is that the, the, in campaigns, it's the outside expenditures that end up being the largest single force in most people's campaigns. You know, I benefit from having 100,000 contributors as my uh, contributor base, the largest in the Democratic Party in the House. People come to our website, congresswithguts.com. They want to see our emails. They want to see what we're up to. They want regular reports from Washington, D.C., and they make contributions. Uh, that, that's something that is generally not true. Generally now, what people are concerned about the most is the, uh, the so-called independent expenditures in many races across the country. Leadership has no influence over that. Leadership cannot create an independent expenditure. It's independent. They cannot stop an independent expenditure. So in that sense, the leadership is weakened because they have much less influence over the re-election campaigns. Uh, another reason why leadership is weakened is because uh, the, some of the traditional tools are simply no longer there. Uh, the leadership does, to some degree, control committee assignments, but the committee assignments have become uh, less arbitrary and more routinized in terms of seniority. Uh, the leadership no longer has earmarks to offer members of Congress uh, in terms of cooperation or not cooperating. The leadership does still make an effort to some degree to raise money uh, for individual members, but typically what leadership does now is that it just drops it into the party pool, uh, the, the DCCC, uh, the NRCC, and so uh, and, and they drop it into the general pool. No individual member feels that he or she is going to necessarily benefit from that. So the result of that is that the leadership can do nothing but uh, implore, beg, uh, try to persuade, and that's something anybody can do. You know, that the secret to our success during that effort and other efforts is that we have the only tool that still exists, which is logic, reason, and persuasion. Well, with that, we'll be back after these words with Congressman Alan Grayson here at live at Roots Camp on the agenda, Series XM Progress 127. This is going to be a fake break. They'll insert the commercials after a fake break. We're back here at Roots Camp. Yay! Sirius XM Progress 127. We're joined by Alan Grayson. How much during the Syria debate did outside forces make a difference in terms of petition deliveries to Capitol Hill and those standard online activities? Oh, well, the, the compelling outside force was the public will. Uh, and I've never seen anything like that before. And I spoke to members of Congress who had been there in Congress for 20 years or more, and they told me they had never seen anything like that before. The letters, w once we informed people properly of the issues, what was at stake, the arguments, not just for, which the administration was giving, but also against, the letters and the emails and the telephone calls just poured in, just poured in like a tsunami. Uh, many members actually reported their numbers, and the numbers were coming in 100 to 1 against. There was one member who tried to set up a telephone town hall meeting, no, sorry, an actual town, a town hall meeting, um, and after three questions from people who were in favor of military intervention, they ran out of questions. There was nobody else in that meeting who was willing to, to ask a question that was meant to be in favor of military intervention. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, people were against. So th the result of that was that there were members who um, were willing to deal with the issues sort of on the merits, and then there were members who were saying, you know, people in my district are up in arms about this. They're horrified about this. My hands are tied. I think more the former than the latter, but certainly it helped that the public was weighing in in a way that nobody had ever seen before. On Obamacare, you'd see, um, you know, from Republican districts, you'd see a majority of letters coming in against it. In Democratic districts, in many cases, a majority of emails coming in for it. Uh, this was nothing like that. The public, at least the public that was paying attention and willing to weigh in on this, was overwhelmingly against this, and whether it was through petitions or through telephone calls or any other thing, uh, it made a huge, huge difference in the minds of Congress. Very, very few members of Congress have any interest at all in arguing with the public when the public is 100 to 1 in favor of a position or against it. What seems interesting to me, it was one of the first situations in the past decade where ideology and partisanship split in terms of the public, where people were willing to shed 
their partisan beliefs for a belief in a ideological end? Well, I think it was largely the Republicans who changed their traditional positions. I mean, there's been a peace movement within the Democratic Party now, at least going back to the war in Vietnam. And, and by the way, I think we accomplished something extremely important that's going to have very long-lasting effect. Uh, one of the, the key desires of the peace movement was to make sure that you cannot go to war without public consent. And that's a principle that I think is going to be with us for a long time to come. It's our money, it's our lives, it's our blood, and therefore it should be our decision, a public decision, not uh, some foreign affairs insider decision, not some Washington establishment decision, but a true public decision on whether to go to war or not. Now, that's been the democratic position, at least going back to the 60s. The Republicans have traditionally been in favor of actions like this, and they changed their mind. And I think the, cre the key reason why they changed their mind, for better or for worse, is the identity of the commander-in-chief. Uh, if Obama's for it, they're against it. And that's true whether you're talking about health care reform or about tax reform or about military intervention in Syria or about anything else. And the, they, you know, the disparaging remarks, which caused me some pain, but they were there, the disparaging remarks that I heard about whether Obama could successfully prosecute an action like this turned Republican opinion against war in a way that I have never seen before. What do you think are the long-term implications of <clears throat> the, basically the stopping of the Syria conflict? Well, I, I, first, I think the, the key long-term implication is now uh, there's, uh, in, in, in essence, um, um, a, an addendum to the Constitution. You know, the Constitution says that Congress has the authority to declare war. Uh, now it appears that the people have a way to weigh in on this. Uh, it, the President, in, in showing respect and due regard for constitutional principles regarding war powers, has implicitly given the public an opportunity to say yay or nay. And in fact, that's the way it was in World War I, that's the way it was in World War II, not so much in Vietnam, um, not so much uh, at any time since World War II, and now we're back to what has been the traditional thinking, which is that uh, the public uh, should be making these decisions, not uh, the foreign policy establishment. And the foreign policy establishment was utterly stunned by this. They, they were amazed. Secondly, I, I think that we've, we've seen what amounts to a genuine and successful peace movement in the United States. Uh, there were people who were joining together, uh, taking action in midnight vigils, in email campaigns and petitions, and, and making their voices heard. I had many members of Congress tell me it's not just the emails. I have people coming up to me in the street and telling me, I don't like this idea of war with Syria. So the public has asserted itself um, in a way that I think will have permanent, long-lasting repercussions because the public feels that it's, it's their decision to make right now. Um, beyond that, um, I think that I think over the long term, what we'll see is that the peace movement will become part of a larger movement, uh, which we generally identify as the progressive movement, which will uh, look for and obtain success. Uh, we went for a long, long time between obvious successes. I think most people regarded uh, the, uh, the passage of the Affordable Care Act as a success for progressives, although there was a great deal of debate about that. Some people thought it was a success for the lobbyists. But in any event, uh, we go for long periods of time without success. This was a genuine, unequivocal success for peace, and in my mind, success for uh, progressive values. Uh, I talk about progressive values in terms of justice, equality, and peace. Uh, this was very important to me. I ran as an anti-war candidate in 2006 and 2008. Different war, same principles. What advice would you have in, in closing for people here at <coughs> Roots Camp, for people out listening on Sirius XM for influencing Congress without being a, a highly paid lobbyist. How, how can people make a difference? Is it phone calls? Is it letters? Is it emails? How should, if you wanted to organize for, to get an issue blocked or through Congress, what should people do? Well, I think immediately what we should do is what we did, which is to galvanize public opinion and elevate the issue. What the establishment, the foreign policy establishment, the lobbyist establishment, the military industrial complex, the spying industrial complex, what they want, above all, is for nobody to talk about anything. They, they want public discourse to be silent because that way they get what they want. They always get what they want unless people are paying attention. So in the case of Syria, we saw a, a major change. I think we're going to see a major change now with regard to the Trans-Pacific Partnership coming up. 
uh, the fast track legislation that the president will be introducing soon, I think people are going to be up in arms against that in the same way. So basically you have to elevate the profile of the issue to the point where you have massive numbers of people, millions in the case of the Social Security Medicare cuts. We had, I delivered three million petition signatures to the President and Speaker Boehner against Social Security cuts. When you produce those kinds of numbers, they can't help but pay attention and they realize that people are watching and they will have to pay a price if they ignore. But beyond that, I think ultimately we have to, we have to change our system of campaign finance. Uh, there, the reason why the lobbyists have the inside track is because the lobbyists have the $10,000 checks and they also have the independent expenditures. And that's, that's a system that has de degraded public policy making in this country uh, to, the, to the point where, for instance, you could literally have 90% of the public in favor of a change in public policy, like, for instance, mandatory background checks for gun control, and it doesn't make any difference. Congressman Grayson, thank you for joining us today on the agenda. Thank you for uh, d delaying leaving Washington, D.C. to be here with us. It's always a pleasure. You have an outstanding show. It's one of the few places people can turn to to find out the truth. Thank you very much. And we're going to continue here with a panel with Ty Masdorf, Adam Green, and, Mar and Marcy Stetch about organizing for 2014. So stay right here. We'll be back after these words. Hey, nice to see you. And we're back on Sirius XM Progress 127. This is the agenda from Roots Camp. We're joined now by Adam Green, executive director and founder of the PCCC, Marcy Stetch of Emily's List, where she's national press secretary, and Ty Masdorf, who's campaign director of the Senate Majority Pact. These are three of the people who will be organizing for both Democratic and progressive victories in 2014. And I wanted to have them here to talk about what do you think is necessary for us to win at the ballot box in 2014. And let's just start with that. Adam, you can, why don't you go first? Sure. So to sum it up in two words, uh, economic populism. Economic populism is the issue of our day and is the issue that is motivating many voters at the polls. Um, and if Democrats embrace it, people like Elizabeth Warren have proven a model for winning those voters. When Democrats don't embrace it, that populism goes into the other camp and the Tea Party gets those voters. So that's, that's the path to success for our side. To quickly relay one story that I think exemplifies that, in, in 2002, I actually spent a year in South Dakota working on Senator Tim Johnson's re-election campaign and became the accidental liaison to the farmer-rancher community uh, because the farm bill was up that year and I was doing press. You seem press. to be someone who I would say relates to the farmer-rancher right. community we, well, Adam. We had a Jewish vegetarian guy from New Jersey relating to these very um, carnivorous people from South Dakota and pretty much every other press conference we did were about farm issues. So I became the main person interacting with these people and talking with them for hours upon end. And what I realized at the end of the day was you know, these were pro-life, pro-gun, culturally conservative voters who ended up crossing party lines and voting Democrat. And we won that race by 524 votes because Tim Johnson was campaigning hard on economic populism issues, defending family farmers and the little guy on issues like social security against big corporations. And the whole time, they were grumbling in my ear, you know, Tom Daschle is not like him. He's different. And two years later, the person that we beat, John Thune, ended up unfortunately beating Tom Daschle. So what I saw was, especially in the red states, we need to be even bolder on economic, economic populism issues. And if people like Mark Pryor and Mary Landrieu and others uh, adopt economic populism and fight for little guy this year, we should have really good majorities next year. Marcy? Uh, well, thanks for having us today. It's uh, very exciting to be talking about 2014 because 2014 is going to be huge for women candidates. Um, Emily's List, uh, the organization I work for, has been around for 28 years and we are uh, aimed at um, electing more democratic, pro-choice democratic women across the board, up and down the aisle, um, <clears throat> and across the nation. And in 2014, looking out ahead at some of the most highest profile races there are, it's clear that women are the answer. Um, in 2010, when the Tea Party took over and, and uh, they came in with their whole movement, um, I don't think any of us anticipated that they would be um, waging the war on the backs of working families, and in particular, uh, working women. Um, and it's so clear that the best way to push back against these Tea Party Republicans is to elect more pro progressive and pro-choice Democratic women. Um, in 2012, we saw historic momentum for electing women to Congress. We have a historic number right now, and that's uh, much to the success of our organization and, and to a number of the women who we support. But looking forward to 2014, 
Uh, places like Kentucky, where you have Allison Lundergan Grimes, who's running against Mitch McConnell, Michelle Nunn, who's running against a whole pack of crazies in the state of, of uh, Georgia. Uh, you've got Mary Burke, who's running against Scott Walker. Uh, these are all really important, high-profile races, and these are opportunities to, to get some of these Republicans, who should have never been there in the first place, out. So for us, we're squarely focused on 2014 right now and excited about building on the momentum that we had from 2012. Ty, you spend your days at Senate Majority PAC only focusing on the Senate in 2014. So what, what, are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, my thoughts are what's going to win is, is the people in this room. Um, if, if you look at what sort of conventional wisdom is, is 2014, the electorate is going to be older, the electorate is going to be wider, the electorate is going to be more conservative. And that, that, that hurts Democrats. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily true if folks get out and organize. Um, it, Virginia is a great example, right? In 2012, uh, President Obama was able to win. In 2013, uh, Terry McAuliffe kept the sort of the Obama electorate, wh whatever, uh, however you want to describe that. 20% was African American, youth turnout was up, Latino turnout was out. Um, if you look at Wisconsin, in 2010, Scott Walker and Ron Johnson won, two guys who have absolutely no business winning Wisconsin. What happened? 8% of the electorate was 18 to 24, and I think 9% of the electorate was minority. Now look at 2012, you have President Obama and Tammy Baldwin both co having overwhelming victories in, in Wisconsin. You have the youth vote up to 11%, you have the uh, minority vote up to 10%. And so it's, it's up to us to sort of reach those non-traditional voters. Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have the underpinning of the Obama campaign. So that means it's going to be harder. That means you've got to get on Facebook and reach people. You've got to, you know, figure out where these folks are and get them to the polls. So, you know, I, I don't want to say sort of one issue or not is going to be the defining, but what's going to be the defining is, is making sure that folks know what the choice is for this election and getting them to the polls. To you again, Ty, how much do you think Tea Party crazies will come into play in, let's say, Texas now, Kentucky, and elsewhere. Yeah, I, I think that it's I think that it's a huge problem for the for the Republican Party. Um, they, you know, particularly uh, the the problem. Uh, my friend Marcy Stetch here. The problem that they have relating to women voters. Um, if you look at at Ken Cuccinelli, he carried so much baggage, particularly with with women voters. And, and Republicans know that. In 2012, you saw historic uh, gender gap. And in 2014, you have people like Tom Cotton, you have people like Tom Tillis, you have people like uh, Bill Cassidy in, in Louisiana who are running on these very irresponsible, very reckless um, agendas that, 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 that are going to turn off women voters, turn off moderate voters. And, and, and I think that's a huge problem for them. And you saw the Americans for Prosperity are up with $6 million of ads, and they're trying to address this in a very ham-handed way. They, you know, have, have women direct to camera. But that is not going to be able to paper over the policies that they're advocating. Well, it seems like they're handling in a ham-handed way. There was another story, Marcy and Politico, a week ago about how they're again, having training sessions on how not to be a sexist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the, the problem with the Republicans is, you know, they think they can fix things with a sensitivity training or a photo op. Um, it's not about that. It's, it's about their policies, as Ty mentioned. They continue to wage an agenda that is just terrible for women and for families. Um, and it's not just necessarily about the agenda, but it's about the fact that they put this front and center. If you look at a state like Pennsylvania, where you have Tom Corbett running, he is Mr. Mandatory Ultrasound. He's the guy who just said, close your eyes. And the idea that we could have a progressive champion like uh, Allison Schwartz running against him, who has been a clear champion uh, for women, is a huge contrast for us. And it's an opportunity to really talk about what really matters right now. Um, the Republicans have done no favors for themselves over the past year. Uh, they've tried to rebrand. Uh, they've tried to hold these trainings. They've tried to start different initiatives. But the bottom line is about their policies, and it's about the, the fact that they don't necessarily like women in their party right now. It's, it's clear in the polling. You can see that their party doesn't value women um, in their party, and they don't value women leaders. And that's sad to see because we know at Emily's List, you know, we are obviously want, we're doing our piece of the pie to make sure that there are more women at the table when it comes to Democratic women. Republicans don't have that. There is no Republican Emily's List, and that's sad because there should be more women at the table, not just Democratic women. And Adam, in the past week, We've seen some organized pushback in the Wall Street Journal with Third Way against what you said to open up, against the idea that populism is a winning electoral issue. And obviously, you've reacted to that publicly in emails to your staff. How do you think that plays out throughout the course of this year? Right. So for those unfamiliar, this gets back to economic populism. 
So there's a, a, a think tank called Third Way. Um, some folks I know used to work there. And basically, they are funded by Wall Street and big corporations. And you know, our gripe with them is not that they exist or that they get funding from those people, but they, give, they purport to give Democrats good policy and political advice. And what it usually is is actually very bad political advice, stuff that's unpopular with voters and not very progressive. Um, and you know, if that's not called out, you know, that's a problem. Uh, so one great example is during the public option fight, the New York Times poll showed that 80% of Democratic voters, 70% of independent voters, and at that point, 50% of Republican voters supported the public option. That same poll, almost in the demographic section, had a question about, would you call yourself liberal, moderate, or conservative? You know, we do polling all the time. Almost never is the number of people who call themselves liberal over 20%. You know, it's kind of a, you know, Republicans have been very good at scarring that word. What Third Way did was they looked at this and said, hey, the public option is a liberal policy. Only 20% of the voters are liberal, so Democrats run away from the public option, even though there was a straight shot you know, answer to that question in the same poll. And the problem is that they're giving Democrats really bad advice. So, you know, I think like the others up here, we do our own polling, and what we show is that in red states, purple states, and blue states, Bold economic populist ideas like expanding social security benefits, popular by two to one in Kentucky, three to one in Texas, two to one in, in Iowa, three to one in, in Colorado. Things like jailing Wall Street bankers is usually through the roof, sometimes as much as 10 to one. Now, part of our challenge this cycle is making sure that the consultant class, which has a vested interest in winning, is polling the right questions. And unfortunately, what we see is that oftentimes economic populism issues don't get included in polls. So I think it's to all of our advantage to make sure that bold economic populism questions, things like many of the items of Elizabeth Warren's agenda are in polling, and if, and if Democrats look to Elizabeth Warren as their North Star for their messaging, we'll have a very successful 2014. Ty, a lot of Democrats particularly, let's say Mary Landrieu unleashed one of the first ads of her campaign, and it was essentially uh, uh, not an attack on the president, but very much separating themselves herself on Obamacare. How much of that do you think we'll see in 2014, and how much of that is necessary? Um, well, look, Mary Landrieu has deep roots in Louisiana, yes. so she knows the state better than I do. Right. So I'm not going to say to Mary Landrieu, Mary Landrieu, you're doing this right or you're doing this wrong. Um, but what I would say is each one of these races is going to be a choice. It's going to be a choice between, you know, Mary Landrieu or Bill Cassidy. It's going to be a choice between, you know, Mark Pryor or Tom Cotton. It's a choice between Tate, Kay Hagan, Tom Tillis. These are local races about local issues. You know, it's funny. Um, I, I'm from Montana. Um, and in 2012, you know, you have a huge national presidential election going on, uh, all kinds of, you know, big issues. What was one of sort of the defining issues in the Montana Senate race was how wolves were handled in the wilderness. And, and that, was, that just shows you that these races are going to be about local takes on issues, and maybe that's you know, local vision for Medicare, local vision for you know, uh, Social Security, or local, local issues, flood insurance, whatever it might be. So I think that, that, that Mary Landrieu, who's, who's fighting to make the uh, health care reform better, um, is going to have a, a, a distinct vision than a Bill Cassidy who wants to raise the Social Security age, who wants to make Medicare more expensive. So I, I think that what you're going to see is these senators uh, in these, these challengers keeping the race about their state, about the people of their state. And we'll be back with Ty Masdorf of Senate Majority PAC, Adam Green of the PCCC, and Marcy Stetch of Emily's List after these words. Fake break that we'll insert for radio. And we're back here on the Agenda Series XM Progress 127 from Roots Camp with Ty Masdorf of Senate Majority PAC, Adam Green of the PCCC, and Marcy Stetch of Emily's List. Marcy. How does Emily's List go about recruiting women candidates? Because that's one of the things you do. You've clearly increased the amount of women in politics, increased the number of pro-choice women. How do you recruit good candidates? Because I think winning elections starts with Having good, good candidates. candidates. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, at Emily's List, we have um, a number of different ways that we go about doing this. Um, it's very important that we invest in the pipeline, as we like to call it at Emily's List, um, <clears throat> because we know that today's mayor could go on to be tomorrow's governor who could then be on the presidential ticket in 2024 or 2028 down the line. Um, so we are very focused on this and, and we have a, a political opportunity program. We call it our POP program. You can check it out if you go to emilyslist.org um, and find out <coughs> more about it. But ultimately, uh, you know, we do these very intensive trainings. We have 
you know, women in, uh, across the country who join us in a room, we give them every single answer they would ever need to know about running a campaign. What is that like? We know that women are tuned a little differently when it comes to men when it, com when it comes to running for office. They want to know all of the answers to all of the questions. And so we give them the answer to those questions. Um, and the awesome thing is at the end of it, we ask them to run. And a lot of them do and a lot of them win. Um, and it's everything from city council members to people who are running for state legislatures to people who are thinking about running for Congress and up from there. Um, I think about the impact of a lot of those women who have come to us and, and been part of our POP program or POP trainings. That's really where the spark happens. Um, and, and it's exciting for us uh, to continue to recruit these women because we know that um, we can find them at one point in their career and help them um, usher from county board like uh, Tammy Baldwin in Wisconsin, who we then helped get her to Congress. And now she's a United States Senator. She, we've been with her every step of her career. And we're very excited to see the work that she's doing in Congress today, in, in the United States Senate today. Adam, your organization is fundamentally a grassroots organization. How will you encourage grassroots progressives to get involved in 2014 and not let it slide? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I agree with everything that was just said about candidate recruitment and the importance of a pipeline. And we actually had this really great opportunity, you know, since the government shut down, several more Republicans are vulnerable that weren't perceived as vulnerable before. So one way that we've actually been engaging the grassroots is in the effort of recruiting Democratic candidates in some of these districts. We actually just helped a candidate get off the ground uh, this week uh, in Wisconsin, uh, the home state of my friend Melissa Ryan out there, uh, named <laughs> uh, Kelly Westland. Uh, Kelly Westland, W-E-S-T-L-U-N-D dot com is her, is her website. And she's this great progressive woman who's running against Sean Duffy, a former reality TV star, who said that he struggles to get by on $174,000 a year. Well, it's but hard. We, it's really hard to get by in that amount. But you know, our members on the ground recommended that we talk to her when we just put out an email. Uh, you know, the wisdom of crowds is alive and well. And I think this conference, Roots Camp, really embodies that. And we're doing that in other districts. There's some other people who are kind of on the verge of running. And similar to what was just said, you know, really asking people to run, training them, giving them the confidence is key. And then once they decide to run, it's really important that they understand that when they are out there talking about things like taking on Wall Street, they're probably not going to get Wall Street funding. So last cycle, you know, our, we, we raised about $2.7 million for candidates, made about 2 million phone calls in the final month of 2012 for candidates. Uh, the high water mark was Elizabeth Warren, but that went all the way down to House and even City Council in some places. Uh, we're happy to have a member of our team, Katrina Shanklin, who's in her 20s, run in a competitive primary in Wisconsin, and she na she's now the youngest member of the Wisconsin legislature. And that was thanks to grassroots support. So the grassroots have an enormous role to play in this Roots Camp conference is really the embodiment of how we can perfect some of the best, conference, uh, best practices that all of us use. Now, Ty, how does Senate majority, how do you decide what races to be involved in and what ones to let go? I don't, not specifics, but just the metrics you guys use when you make those decisions. Yeah, a um, couple things. One, you know, we're, we're involved where, where races are competitive. So, you know, right now, knock on wood, uh, Republicans haven't been able to expand the map. They haven't been able to get into a Colorado. Um, Scott Brown's kind of flirting with New Hampshire, but I don't really know. I mean... Adam probably has more experience with Scott Brown than I do. I mean, he he's doesn't seem like he's that credible. You know, they haven't been able to really get off the ground in Minnesota. Um, so what, what we're looking at is, one, where, where these races are, are going to be competitive. And then, two, we, we came about as sort of a response to a lot of the right-wing money. So you see Americans for Prosperity who have put $5.5 .5 million into North Carolina. They've put $1.7 million into Louisiana. They've put uh, almost a million dollars into Alaska, which pretty much can buy the entire state a lobster dinner. Um, so that's when, you know, when, when we see these places that, that these right-wing groups, uh, Karl Rove, are getting involved in, you know, we're, we're there to fight back. Because one of the things I was talking about 2010, the electorate um, obviously uh, being sort of less this rising American electorate. And one of the reasons, one of the things that we saw is our candidates were just getting slammed on the airwaves. Um, you know, in, uh, in Wisconsin, it was, it was almost three to one. In Pennsylvania, where Pat Toomey had no business winning the state of Pennsylvania, uh, it, it, there was $8 million in outside spending versus $70,000 for, um, uh, yeah, Sestak. So it, that, was, that was like an eight, you know, huge, or 700,000, so almost an eight to, eight, eight to one advantage. Um, so, you know, we had to fight back about the, against this. And look, you know, the, the Koch brothers are worth $22 billion. So are we going to be able to match them dollar for dollar? No, but we have to stay competitive on the airwaves. 
And I would add to that too. It's it's interesting, um, you know, being up here with so many people in the progressive movement. I mean, we have to join forces. Like to Ty's point, we're never going to be able to match them dollar for dollar. Um, but the awesome thing is how many people in the progressive movement are committed to joining together. Um, I think about our Women Vote program, which is a, a program that's designed to turn out women voters, educate them about the stakes in the election. Um, in a state like Wisconsin, uh, for Tammy Baldwin's real uh, uh, election in last cycle. We um, came together with, uh, with unions, with other organizations, progressive organizations, and spent the money we needed to spend to make sure we turned out women voters and got people to the polls. Um, I think Democrats and progressives are very smart to know that we can't do it alone. We're never going to be uh, Carl Rover, the Koch brothers, or anyone who's going to have a lot of money um, just independently, that we have to pool our resources. And we see that happening every day in the progressive movement. So it's very proud to be part of that. And just sorry, one, one, one last thing on that, and that goes back to the, the people that are here uh, and, and the people that are listening. You know, in the Obama campaign, we, we had this great tool called uh, Targeted Sharing, which allowed you to reach out to your Facebook friends. What was the name of that tool? Um, I targeted Sharing, I think. Is okay, sorry, I just didn't hear. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it, it was this great program where, you know, you could... Uh, um, reach out directly to your Facebook friends. And I think that like on, on election day, it was, it was the first time that an incumbent actually won the undecideds. And that's because people were able to reach out. You know, look, there was, there was almost $2 billion in television ads. So people were turning off their TVs. Their mailboxes were full. You know, their phones were ringing off the hook. But if, you, if I got a note from Marcy on my Facebook page that says, hey, turn out and vote for this candidate, or, you know, if, if, if they sent me an email, that, that personal touch is what's really going to cut through. Um, so I think that things like that are just, are, are so important. It's the, you know, that we talk about people power a lot. And one of the, the impacts of people power is being able to sort of cut through a lot of the clutter. Adam, what's the biggest change you've seen right there? What's the biggest change you've seen since 2006 in terms of online tools, online organizing, and, and what do you think the biggest change will be moving forward? Uh, yeah, we're definitely at a much more sophisticated you know, place than we were in 2006. You know, I guess blogs were still kind of getting off the ground. Um, there was you know, one or two big email lists in the game, and now there's, you know, I think it's just kind of common practice to mobilize mass amounts of people online. Um, you know, what we're doing with data these days, to be able to, the ability to manipulate it and really kind of um, with a precision target voters and target volunteers, donors, uh, is, is just well, you know, it's, it's light years beyond where it was before. And I think that gets to a point that was just made about people power. People power versus, you know, corporate power. People power versus big money. You know, I, I worry sometimes that, you know, that, that juxtaposition can get a little cliched, but it's, it's so true. If you think about um, how the Koch brothers spend, spend their money, you know, they can, they, if they want to, they can pay a Madison Avenue firm 50,000 bucks to make a quote-unquote viral video, right? But someone at this conference, possibly some college kid at this conference, could probably make a much better video for 500 bucks that will actually reach millions of people. And that same ethos transcends but how to, will the consultant feed their child, Adam? How will they feel? How, how, especially when they're struggling with only $174,000 a year or more. Um, right, no, it's a problem um, that's, that's, well, it's not really a problem. It's, for, for us, it's an advantage which is that if you actually figure out through technology how to mobilize mass amount of people, add on top of that an increasing level of sophistication with, with data, um, then that means that you, that you can empower regular people, like was just described, to target their Facebook friends, like I just described, to make it a viral YouTube video for very, very little money and let the Koch brothers waste their millions on the other end. So uh, you know, it just seems like the trajectory is all in our favor. And again, all we have to do is not screw it up. <laughs> well, with that, our hour here at Roots Camp is done and done on Sirius XM Progress 127. I want to thank Ty Masdor for Senate Majority Pack, Adam Green of the PCCC, and Marcy Stetch of Emily's List. And thank you all. Thank you all and enjoy Roots Camp. Yeah.